The Goldberg variations contain a kind of epilogue. Bach could have ended the piece with the triumphant arrival of Variation 29, but he didn't. He kept going for one more variation. Why? What did he want to say? Leonard Felix, a German pianist, helped me put the variation in perspective. I first met Felix in Munich. We'd been corresponding for months and finally met in a square in the town center. Felix brought me first to a music store where we rifled through CDs. He had been visiting this music store since he was a kid when he first became fascinated with classical music. I bought new scores and scores and scores and I just <laughs> ate the music and my parents at the time decided to stop me from having too much material. Over time, Bach's music came to hold a special place in Felix's life. Bach consoled me most of all in very difficult moments in my life, in circumstances where everything seems to be painful or chaotic. Um, when I focused on Bach's world, I felt harmony and also a world of sound where everything is true in some sense. Walking around town with Felix pointing out sights, we boarded a train for the countryside where Felix lives. Much of the time, he's traveling, playing in festivals around Europe. When he's back in Munich, though, he shares a house with his mom, who, by the way, bakes a mean fruitcake. Right now we are in my personal music room. I'm sitting next to my grand piano, and the room is full of scores and books that have some meaning for me. The music room is a place where Felix feels completely comfortable, completely himself. When I come back here, I always feel at home, absorbed by a very fertile atmosphere for musicianship. It's like my personal place, which I really prefer to, to work on music. Variation 30, the last variation in the whole set, speaks more than any other to Bach's home. The reason is that the 30th variation employs a special musical form called a quad libet. Here's harpsichordist Christian Nyquist to explain. That was very common at the time to, to mingle different songs which actually have nothing in common, but make them sound together uh, in, a, in a nice way. A quad libet is like a fancy word for a mashup. In Bach's time, it was less of a high classical form of music than a rowdy game for good musicians. Musicians would get together and sing songs, mixing them and interleaving them on the fly. It was a tradition of the Bach family when they gathered. They just had fun trying out to, to get different songs sung at the same time, which actually had nothing to do with each other. The extended Bach family was full of musicians. Some were church organists, others court musicians, others cantors. Every year, they would get together for a family reunion in a different German town. Felix, joined by Jeremy Dank and Angela Hewitt, sets the scene. The Bach family met and they always had these court events that probably was meaningful for the unity of the family because uh, the Bach family was, they were meeting and singing these German tunes together. And then everyone's sitting around the, the piano or the harpsichord or whatever the hell the Bach was playing on at that time. With a lot of wine and good food, beer. Either dancing or, or eating or drinking or, you know, clinking their beer glasses. <laughs> And they were all musicians, so they could all improvise on, a, on these rather naughty folk songs of the day. I know this is a very elaborate image, but that's the one that I have of this place. It's like sort of after going to the wildest realms, coming back to, to home. So that's the scene. What were they actually singing? What they were doing was mixing individual popular tunes. 
Okay, I'm about to make a slightly indulgent and possibly ridiculous analogy. Hopefully, it will illuminate something about quadlibets, though. The stories of Bach singing quadlibets with his friends and family remind me of college a cappella. When I was in college, I sang in a South Asian fusion a cappella group called Ragapella. It was a ton of fun. We mixed Bollywood songs with popular songs from the West. One of my personal favorites, which you're listening to now, mixed Jani Kichahe Man, a Hindi song from a popular romantic movie, with Usher's Burn. Despite the fact that they had absolutely nothing to do with each other, the two songs worked really well together. So well that they could be layered on top of each other at the end of our mashup. Thanks for indulging me there. That was fun to listen back. The point is that a quadlibet is not that different. In a quadlibet, Bach and his friends and family would take totally unrelated, popular or folk songs and combine them. The trick was to find melodies that worked well on top of each other in counterpoint. This is Nyquist again. They started with more uh, simple songs and it even turned into, well, not political correct <laughs> songs. <laughs> it was in this context that Bach wrote Variation 30. Here's the beginning, which you've heard a few times now. What he does, he uses two Saxonian folk songs. I'm going to tell you the, 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 the translations now. Uh, one is uh, called Cabbage and Turnips Have Driven Me Away. Had my mother cooked meat, I had stayed longer. <laughs> in the first tune, the singer's complaining about his mother's cooking. Classic in Great Sun. Here's that tune. The interesting thing about this melody is that it is actually the old Bergamasca, which comes from Bergamo in Italy. And there's one piece by Frescobaldi, which is called uh, Bergamasca, and it starts like that. He goes on a little bit differently. And we know, or it is, it is, uh, there's clear evidence that Bach knew this piece. And the Bergamasca was anyway a very popular song, so it made its way from Italy to Germany and probably other parts in Europe. So Bach picked up this melody and used it as one of the melodies in the quad libet. The first song, Cabbage and Turnips Have Turned Me Away, seems to be saying, I better go, I'm tired of all these vegetables. This is that tune played on the piano by Leonard Felix. He's making fun of all these variations that have been taking place. So cabbage, cabbage and turnips have driven me away. <laughs> and then the other melody is, I haven't been with you so long. Come here, come here. Yeah, hmm. come close to me. So the, the text also refers to, uh, to that the theme has been gone for a long time. <laughs> Here's the second tune on the piano. Come here, come here. It's shorter than the first. That's basically it. The final part of the Goldbergs is a return to the aria that we heard at the beginning. With this second tune of the quad libet, it's like Bach is calling out to the aria, come back, come back. Well, he starts with, I haven't been so long with you. Then after the, the first song comes in here in the beginning. The first melody quickly transitions to the second. alto answers with the, the other song, while at the same time, the soprano does the first melody. And then the soprano takes over the turnip song, so to say, <laughs> and, and the alto continues with, with what it had started. 
It can be hard to hear what's going on. The point is that the two songs are popping up like gophers. First they're in one voice, then suddenly in another. I mean, he splits up the songs and just inserts them as he wishes, as he pleases, and creates... It's, it's, I mean, if you think about it, it's just... <laughs> Incredible. <laughs> Incredible, yeah. What's amazing about this variation is that it works. Like any good mashup, Bach had to make it sound like the songs were meant to be played together. And just to show off, he keeps shifting which voice is playing which song, like a game of tag. The crazy thing about this quadlibet, it's such high counterpoint art, what he does here to connect those two songs together, because we still have the bass. Mm -hmm. He just makes it work together with the bass line. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's, it's, it's funny. It just contains everything. As with all the variations, the original bass line from the aria is preserved. It's a third voice at play in the variation. Leonard Felix demonstrates. So I can show the bass line, which is yeah. similar to the aria. So here, we have... And so on. really succeeded in using the same bass line as in the theme in combination with these familiar, also humorous German folk tunes, which I find amazing. And especially in this order, as variation 13, not to start with something very serious, but instead of it, really showing that after this mastery of the 29 variations before, he's still able to show us his laughing side. Once again, Bach's sense of humor shines through right at the end of the piece, and after so much music that is intensely serious. Bach could have ended with Variation 29, which sounds like the ultimate triumphant finale. But he didn't end with Variation 29. Instead, he ended with humor. This is Jeremy Dank. I like the idea of a little humble self-deprecation, meanwhile having written one of the great masterpieces of Western civilization. But still, you know, he's still willing to say, oh, it's, you know, <laughs> this has also kind of been an ordeal in one way or another. Variation 30 is unexpected in many ways. For one, Bach almost never wrote quadlibets. He only wrote one other quadlibet that survives today. For another, at this juncture in the piece, based on the piece's structure, we would expect Bach to write a canon at the 10th. After all, every set of three variations ends with a canon. That's not what we get here. In spite of the humor written into the piece, it's another variation that displays a duality. Long before I knew about the songs that Bach was mashing up in this variation, I thought of it as the grandest, most comforting variation of the whole set. When listening to the piece, I would wait for this variation, for a sense of the world finally coming back together after being split apart in the preceding variations. Philip Kennicott, the critic, describes it like this. That last variation, by taking these popular songs, the words of which would have been known to um, listeners at the time, and the words of which are, you know, in one case a little riddled, and in another case kind of absurd, by setting those within the context of the Goldberg bass line and as a variation, and by weaving them together in such a way that they, were, they take on, frankly, majesty. You know, this the, the third variation, if played in a broad way, could be the end of a Brahms symphony. Yeah, and when I when I play it, if no one's listening, I will sometimes double the bass line just to bring out a kind of buzoni like sickness, a more 19th century quality to it. I know that that's a terrible thing to do, and I would never do it, you know, if I were playing this piece for people publicly. But I love to make that variation. I, li I like to push the, you know, expand the tempo and let it let it have that kind of choral richness. The critic in Kennicott recoils at changing what Bach wrote, but part of him can't help extending and indulging the harmonies. The question is, what is Bach getting at with Variation 30? I think he's saying that, you know, the lesson of life is 
to not take these things too seriously that, you know, one has to go out in the world with a little bit of a smile on your face, regardless of what happened in the 25th variation, regardless of what's happened in your own life, that there's a kind of grandeur to the emotional, even keel of that last variation. Bach's only other surviving quadlibet was meant for a wedding celebration, written near the time of his own wedding to his first wife, Maria Barbara. In fact, some scholars think he might have written it for his own wedding. This is the Leonard Consort from the Netherlands. Now, this is getting extremely speculative, but who knows? Maybe Bach had his first wife in mind when he wrote Variation 30. Maybe he thought about her in Variation 25, about her sudden death and his grief. And then in Variation 30, he returned to her again, intent not to dwell in sadness, but instead to recall the day of their wedding. True or not, for Bach, a quadlibet probably reminded him of family, of singing with his sons and his cousins, of reunions and laughter and drinking wine, of the unity of his musical clan. After the extreme highs and lows of the previous variations, with the quadlibet, we return to Earth and return home. We close with Leonard Felix, at home in his music room, playing Variation 30. Thanks for listening. In this episode, you heard music performed by Leonard Felix as well as Hayon Choi. You also heard Stanford Ragapella singing Johnny Kachahe Burn. And you heard a Bach quadlibet performed by the Leonard Consort. Join us next time as we bring the Goldberg Variations to a close. Thanks for listening, and see you then.